done for us, all that you are, and all that you reveal yourself to be in your word. We ask your blessings be upon us at this time as we try to, just for a moment, close out the anxieties and the worries and the distractions that are in our life, that we can focus on you and worship, and that we can open up your word and learn something useful this week. We ask all these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen. All right, now I'm ready. All right. Well, Keith Lancaster is not here this week, so I can talk however long I want. Right, Dave? All right. No, we had a busy week last week. Saturday was Song Fest. Sunday was Worship with Keith, and he was here helping us uh, be joyous and, and energized and all that. And uh, he was amening me the whole sermon until the last 15 minutes where he thought I was done, but I wasn't done talking yet. <laughs> then he stopped amening me. Uh, and we had Monday Night for the Master, which is a great work that we do here once a month. Kind of give calls to people that need calls, make cards, have prayers for people that need our prayers. And so, very busy week last week. This week is also very busy. We're busy for a, a good while looking forward to us. Uh, this year is going to be extremely busy trying to be busy in the kingdom of our Lord, as we sang just a moment ago. So, this morning what I want to do is something that I've been planning for and preparing for for a little while. If you'll recall, a couple of weeks we talked about the book of James. We talked about James for a good long bit. It's usually a longer series than I like to do, but you can't just stop halfway through James. You have to keep going. So uh, as I was preaching through James with you on Sunday mornings, I had all these ideas pop up throughout the week that I have to write down in my notes to make sure I don't forget the idea. And one of them was uh, something I've mentioned before, either in a sermon or a Bible class, about certain things that you can do in your own personal study that's helpful to kind of find these threads. And if you keep following those threads, you'll figure out an important theological thing. And one of those things that you can do is focus on particular phraseology you find in Scripture. The idea of not being deceived or deceive not yourselves. That idea of being deceived is a consistent theme, especially in the New Testament. So what I want to do is talk about what it means to be deceived, for someone to be deceptive, and things that we should be cautious of, of not being tricked into thinking or believing or living a certain way, because the scriptures show us uh, what are some points of deception in our lives. We begin with the Old Testament here in the book of Proverbs, chapter 14, verse 25. Uh, the book of Proverbs is interesting because for me, I can just turn literally anywhere in Proverbs and then just read one particular line, and there's no real context to it, which is very rare in Scripture. Oftentimes, you go to a book and you read a line, you have to read the paragraph before, the paragraph after to figure out what's being discussed, to not pull that verse out of a context and use it inappropriately. In Proverbs, it's really hard to do that. You can't just uh, look at a context because it's just a list of things that are good to know, things that we should live our lives by. And here is one proverb, Proverbs 14, 25. A truthful witness saves lives, but one who breathes out lies is deceitful. So you find that deceitful thing there. And this seems almost obvious to most of us. If you're someone that's going before a court of law and you speak the truth, as you should probably want to do, then you're going to help save life, find justice and harmony and peace and so on. But someone who's lying about something is being deceitful. They're being deceptive. So we begin with that very obvious point. You then have Proverb 24, 28. Be not a witness against your neighbor without cause, and do not deceive with your lips. So lying was in the previous proverb. Here is being deceitful with your lips, the things that you say. And so we see just by two proverbs, there's a focus here on the idea of deception involving something that someone says. I don't know about you, but I've met some people that when you have a conversation with them, something just kind of feels a little off. You ever talk to someone like that? Only one person's nodding their head yes. So maybe I'm that person. I don't know. The idea, 
you meet someone, you hear what they're saying to you, and there just seems to be something else going on kind of behind the scenes. And a couple of times in my ministry, I've had people that I've talked to and confessed to and talked about my issues. And then I'll hear from another friend, hey, did you know that so-and-so is talking about that thing that you shared in confidence? I'm like, oh, that's what that was. Oh, that little thing working behind the scenes is that gossip mill going about. And the idea of being deceitful with your speech is a warning that we find here in Scripture. In Psalm 101, verse 7, we find this. No one who practices deceit shall dwell in my house. No one who utters lies shall continue before my eyes. So in case it wasn't clear, the scriptures are opposed to someone being deceptive and deceitful. God is not a, a person who favors someone who's lying with their words and someone who's acting one way but actually is another way. If we go over to the New Testament, though, we find some very pointed uh, charges laid against someone who is decept, uh, decept, uh, deceptful. Deceptive? There, there we are. Words work sometimes. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12. This is the Apostle Paul, who is a minister and apostle of God, writing to a younger preacher. And he was really young. He was like 30 years old. So he's needing to hear the idea of, of what it means to be a faithful minister or servant of God. He says this, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. The bulk of the times that you see this word deception used in Scripture is mostly in reference to someone who is a so-called false teacher. Someone that's pretending to present the word of God or the gospel, the good news of God, and is not telling the truth. Now, lying about what you had for breakfast or maybe even lying on your taxes now that April's coming around, that's not good. You shouldn't do that, right? Right? Okay, don't lie on your taxes. Avoid jail time. That's the idea. But when someone is lying about what the word of God is, that's a whole other level. Going to jail is bad for lying on your taxes. But the eternal realm is something that we should not be deceived about. And in the first century church, there were people that were being deceptive about what God actually required of his people, his creation. It's a whole other category. If you go over to Romans chapter 16, beginning in verse 17, he says, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions, which is, by the way, the opposite of unity, which is our focus on Sunday morning uh, Bible class time, who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine, the teaching that you have been taught. So be careful of people that are trying to put roadblocks between you and being unified with your brothers and sisters in Christ. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. Now, Paul, again, is writing this to a group of Christians in the city of Rome that he's never met before but heard a lot about. And he really wants to get to Rome, and he concludes the book by saying, watch out for people who say they serve the Lord Christ, but their teachings and their lifestyles do not add up to them being a servant of Jesus Christ. Don't be deceived by those that have smooth talk and flattery, of which I can do neither, so you're, you're safe here, right? I can't talk smoothly. I can't flatter too much. The idea of uh, people being out there and being a little slimy with their, the way that they teach the Word of God is the warning here in Romans chapter 16. If you look back into the, book, the gospel accounts, you'll find four different versions of the life of Jesus. And you have the so-called synoptic gospels that see things the same way, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And then you've got the oddball, the old guy John, the apostle John, writing his account 
He didn't read the notes from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He wrote his own gospel. And in John, we have some inclusions there that's not in Matthew, Mark, and Luke that are very interesting about how he chooses to say things. So, for example, John chapter 7, beginning in verse 44, here's right in the middle of Jesus' ministry. He's healing those that need, um, that have sicknesses and illnesses. He's casting out demons. He's teaching about the word of God, the kingdom of God. And then you have the Pharisees, the elect, elite, religious people of the day. And here is a conversation they were having. Some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers then came out to the chief priest and Pharisees, who said to them, Why did you not bring him? And the officers answered, No one ever spoke like this man. They were not used to someone who was uneducated, who was not a Pharisee, who didn't run a synagogue talking about the word of God with such authority, such command. So they were saying, this guy is something different. And the Pharisees answered them, have you also been deceived? It was a common thought in the first century during the ministry of Jesus that he was someone that was by smooth talk and by flattery deceiving the people away from the word of God, not recognizing he was the word of God. Remember John chapter 1 and verse 1? In the beginning, talking about Genesis 1, 1 of creation, was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14 of John chapter 1 talks about how the Word was born unto us, into this world. That's Jesus. So they were careful to not be deceived, not recognizing the reality that the Word of God was performing those things in their very midst. So the idea of being deceived by a false teacher is by and far the lump sum of deception in the New Testament. However, everybody with me? Everybody with me? Okay. Don't be deceived by false teachers. That's the first lesson. This next part is the key. I've been building up. That was the foundation for this. The worst kind of deception, according to the very word of God, is not by a false teacher. You can verify what someone teaches. Is that in the Bible or not? There's no excuse for us to be deceived in that way. The very worst kind of deception, according to the Bible, is self-deception. And that's very easy to fall into. There are little stories we tell ourselves about things that sometimes makes things that are not right seem right to us, or it's a little better at at the very least. Over in the book of James, hopefully you know where it is by now, James chapter 1, beginning in verse 13, James writes these words to the, the early first century church. Here's the warning, verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. That's a form of deception, by the way. You're being tempted, going through a difficult time in your life. There are trials in your life, and you're saying, you know what, God's testing me right now. Uh, I don't know about that. Because James says, God cannot be tempted with evil. And he himself tempts no one. There's a person in the Bible called the tempter for a very good reason, right? But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. He shows us the pattern of someone losing their spiritual soul to the idea of sin in this way. You have desire that leads you towards a sinful thing that gives birth to sin. And then sin continues and it leads towards death, if not stopped, if not covered up by the blood of Jesus Christ. He concludes this statement in verse 16. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. If you are in sin, if you're going towards spiritual death, be aware God's not responsible for that. Don't deceive yourself thinking that God is responsible for you falling into sin. 
That's the first deception, self-deception. In 1 John chapter 2, in verse 24, John writes this, Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. If you listen and believe and follow after someone who is teaching you wrong things about the word of God, you are deceiving yourself. John's writing this letter, 1 John, to encourage people to not be deceived, but to abide in what they originally received as the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you're looking for a book that is full of this idea of self-deception, it's the book of 1 Corinthians. That church has some problems, folks. I mean, you know, we, we might have some issues here from time to time when it comes to miscommunication or scheduling conflicts or any of that, but 1 Corinthians is a book full of serious, mortal, eternal consequences of this church not getting along. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18, he says, Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. That's one of those Christian paradoxes. If you want all these things, your material needs met, what do you do? Don't focus on them. Focus on the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. If you want to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, what do you have to be? Servant of all. If you want to become wise according to God, you have to be foolish. It's one of those things about Christianity. Why? Because the wisdom of this world is folly or foolishness with God. Because it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thought of the wise that they are futile. So let no one boast in men. For all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours and you are Christ and Christ is God's. He's saying you guys are so smart. You're too smart for your own good. You're trying to go back and say who is the one that you want to follow? Apollos, Paul, Jesus, Peter, who's the one that you're following? Don't you know, in your great wisdom, he says sarcastically, that all of us should be unified in Christ and God. That's where we should be. So forget your own understanding and lead unto God's wisdom. Don't deceive yourself, he says. Also in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verse 33, Paul writes this, Do not be deceived, and here's a quote from a poet of the first century, Bad company ruins good morals. Now, folks, I know that you wouldn't be guilty of this. But sometimes there are some people who will admit that they don't always hang around the best influences in their lives. I know it's not you at all. Everyone in your life is a good moral Christian, no doubt about it. Right? But Paul is saying here, the issue for them is they were deceiving themselves, thinking that they could be a beacon of shining light and showing the people who are living in sin the right way. And sometimes that may be the case, but sometimes they can influence you and you're a little bit dimmer than you used to be by the people that you run with. We have to be protective over our own holiness before God. His encouragement here in verse 34, wake up from your drunken stupor, which is, by the way, a very harsh thing for Paul to say. He says, you guys must be drunk, thinking that you, Corinth, in a city like Las Vegas of the first century, can live a Christian holy life by living like you used to live. You guys are out of your minds. As is right, do not go on sinning, for some of you have no knowledge of God, and I say this to your shame. 
Again, Paul's being pretty bold here, saying, you guys have so many issues, and you think you can live the same way now as you used to live before Jesus? You guys don't know who God is. To, to follow that theme, over in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 9, Paul says this, or do you not know, and whenever Paul says that, it's something they should have known, <laughs> or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Don't be deceived. Don't fool yourselves. Neither the sexual immoral, or idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that seems like a pretty bad list, right? Things that we don't want to be. Because apparently, if you live in that kind of way, you're not going to go to the kingdom of God. And here's the kicker in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Such were some of you. Such were some of you. When you look back at your old lifestyle before Jesus transformed it, such were some of us, folks. No doubt about it. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You're not that person anymore. And finally, this is the one that always comes into my mind. Galatians chapter 6, beginning in verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever one sows, that he will also reap. That's the one that comes into my mind more often than not. Don't be deceived. Don't deceive yourself about this. God's not going to be mocked. Whatever you've been sowing, that you're going to reap. And here's the application. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. What's our focus in life? Is it just on our fleshy desires? If we invest in that, then our return will be condemnation. If we are sowing into our spiritual life, our soul, we will reap from that eternal life. Here's the encouragement. Let us not grow weary in doing good. Because in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those that are of the household of faith. If you just focus on one word in Scripture, sometimes it can take you on a journey. The journey this morning about deception has been the idea of looking at Proverbs to see that God is aware deception exists in this world, and his people are not to be a part of it. We go to Psalm to see that God knows deception is in this life. And if you want to be in the household of God, you cannot be someone that's full of deceit. We go to our New Testament and see that there is a danger out there for us spiritually of people that know that what they are teaching is not what God would have them to teach. Then the most dangerous form of deception of all in Scripture is when you can try to trick yourself that you can keep living in a sinful way and be pleasing to God, that you can live in the world and be of the world and be okay, and you can forget that God is not going to be mocked. If you've been focusing only on your fleshly part of your life, the physical things of this world, from that you're going to reap condemnation. But if you keep sowing, and reaping and focusing on your spiritual life and those that are around you, helping them spiritually, then God is pleased with that and you will have eternal life. Deceptions out there, folks. Let's be careful we don't fall into these traps that so many people throughout time has fallen into. The Bible's here to warn us of dangers in our life, and these are just a handful of them the Bible's very clear and very blunt about. So this morning, as we examine ourselves, let's be honest with ourselves, not lying to ourselves about where we are. 
are we focusing on the right things? Are we investing in the right things of life, the spiritual things of life? This morning, if you have a need for any reason to respond to the invitation of our Lord, if we can pray for you, if we can encourage you, if we can do good for you this morning, we are here to serve this family in Thomaston Road. If anyone has a need, you can come forward just now or you can talk to one of our elders at the doors. If you have a need, respond now as we stand and we sing.